If I asked you who or what a Christian is, I wonder how you would respond. Some might simply say, well, a Christian is a follower of Christ. And others might say a, a Christian is a, a person who's placed their faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Consider this one explanation. A 10-year-old little girl was asked by her classmates, what's it like to be a Christian? And she said, it's like being a pumpkin. God picks you from the patch, brings you in, washes all the dirt off of you. Then he cut open the top and scoops out all the yucky stuff. He removes the seeds of doubt, hate, greed, and then he carves you a new smiling face and puts his light inside of you to shine for all the world to see. Well, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these definitions, yet they really don't paint the whole picture or tell the whole story. Yes, a Christian is a person who has placed their faith and trust in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. A Christian is trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior. According to the Bible, though, a Christian has been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, has also become a new creation in Christ. Not only has a change occurred in a person's standing or their relationship with God, but through the indwelling presence of God's Spirit, that change is something that happens practically where we begin this process of transformation, of becoming like Jesus Christ. Salvation is God's gift. It's not earned or deserved. God demonstrates his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You've probably heard before that being a Christian means that we have been saved from the penalty of our sin, that we are being saved from the presence of power of sin, and one day we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. But salvation means more than just waiting for heaven. Have you ever heard the criticism about Christians that they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly use? Salvation means that God has indeed secured our future, but it also means that he has a purpose for you now. And that purpose, simply stated, is to live for him. To trust Christ means to commit your life to him. Becoming a Christian fundamentally means the submission of your will to God's will. And the version of Christianity which says that we can be saved and still cling to our sins but not have any desire to live for Christ, that we can live our lives any way we want to as long as we've made some kind of profession of faith or, or signed somewhere on a dotted line may appear attractive and even popular to some folks, but it's simply not true. Following Jesus is not about convenience. It's about taking up a cross Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself daily and come after me. And that sounds much like a lot deeper commitment than just believing in Jesus. Learning to follow Jesus, learning to be his disciple, means not just trying to deny self, it means learning to die to self. Sometimes the question is raised, well, can a person be a, a believer in Jesus and not a disciple? And the answer to that question thrusts you into a, a debate called lordship salvation. And, 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 a, and a real quick summary is some people say that you need to confess Jesus as Lord the minute you, at salvation. And that if you don't, then you're not saved. And others say, no, uh, we trust Jesus as Savior. And then the, the understanding of lordship is something that can happen later in life. Well, let me... Let me just put it in my own words. While a person may not fully understand all of the changes and all the ramifications that making Jesus Lord is going to mean when they trust him, to knowingly, let me say that again, to knowingly or willingly take the gift of heaven to trust Jesus as Savior and at the same time not make him Lord doesn't understand biblical salvation. His Lordship is where our life song becomes, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Day by day, following Jesus is learning to say yes, Lord, yes. So this morning, I want us to think about our lives as believers 
as fundamentally a life of service. To become a Christian means that I am to serve God. And I can imagine someone thinking, here we go again. The pastor is preaching another recruitment sermon about trying to get people to serve on some committee or to take some Lord, some leadership position in the church. No, that's not what I mean. Because frankly, if we were to grasp what a life of service to God really meant, I don't think getting people to serve in the church would be a problem. Several years ago, I and a fellow pastor had the privilege of going to India, where for a week we taught some classes to some Baptist Indian pastors. And on the way back after our conference, we were in a, a SUV driving back to the city of Chennai. And I asked Dr. Sam Devison, the pastor of the Tamil Baptist Church and kind of like the, uh, the mentor of, of that ministry there, I said, uh, uh, Dr. Sam, what's the greatest need in your church? And he said, getting people to serve. And I told him he wasn't alone. So whether it's the Tamil Baptist Church in India or our church, or I suspect in most churches, the need for people to serve is a, a real need. But if we think about life as a service to God, I want us to think, first of all, that service is the appropriate response to God's grace. Prakash read for us just a few moments ago some very familiar verses from Paul's letter. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. The Scripture is very clear. A relationship with Jesus Christ is God's gift. It's not from any human work or any human effort or any attempt. We may not, however, be quite as familiar with verse 10. For we are his workmanship, masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And what we miss in verse 10 is not only a reaffirmation of grace in verses 8 and 9, but a stated purpose for our lives. Some of you may remember, now this is going way back, many, many years ago when our church participated in the 40 Days of Purpose uh, study. And uh, in one of those studies, it focused on the truth that we're shaped for serving God. Uh, Rick Warren wrote in The Purpose Driven Life, you were put on earth to make a contribution. You weren't just created to consume resources, to eat and breathe and take up space. God designed you to make a difference in your life. While many best-selling books, he says, offer advice on how to get the most out of life, that's not the reason God made you. You were created to add to life on earth, not just take from it. God wants you to give something back. So let me ask you a question. Do you live with an awareness that God has a purpose for your life? And I'm speaking to everyone. You might be a child, uh, an adult, senior adult, a married person, a single person. But do you live today with the awareness that God has a purpose for your life? Now think about that for a second. See, God didn't create us just to sit and soak he created us to serve. Your creator, your maker made you with a purpose, and that purpose is tied to your relationship with Jesus. Listen again. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we walk in them. We are his workmanship. And the Greek word, uh, which is only used, by the way, twice in the New Testament, is where we get our English word poem. But it can mean any work of art a statue, a song, architecture, a poem, or a painting. It conveys the idea of something that has been artfully and beautifully created. You are God's work of art, not a piece of work. You're a work of art. You are his masterpiece, his poem. You are a unique, one-of-a-kind, original creation, and perhaps in a little less refined language, God don't make no junk. Notice that the Bible says that you were created for good works, which means that God didn't call you just to be, but to do. There are things for us to do. 
activities in which to engage, a ministry and service to perform. And the contrast in this passage is powerful. Good works do not, in fact, cannot save us, but as people who have been saved, we are to do good works. One comparison suggests that works are to salvation what thunder is to lightning, an inevitable result. Notice that God has prepared these good works beforehand so that we should walk in them. Now, Paul doesn't provide a list of good works to which he's referring. And while he's speaking to the church collectively, there is also an application for each of us individually. Good works are the expression of our relationship with Jesus. It is good works that characterize the life of the believer. And the Bible says that God prepared them ahead of time so that we should walk in them. And the idea of walking in them is so that we'll fall into them. They're already there. We just have to discover them. So what kinds of good works? Well, they're the good works in Christ. They are the works that grow out of our relationship with Him, the works that are initiated and energized by the Spirit of God. Vine, in his commentary, said, it signifies every kind of activity undertaken for the name of Christ Everything so undertaken is a means of fruitfulness, and the operating power is the indwelling Holy Spirit, whom the believer is entirely on whom the believer is entirely dependent. God has prepared a good work for you to do, a service for you to do. He has a ministry that He's laid out for you, and all of this grows out of God's purpose in your life. And I might just speculate that perhaps this good work that God has for you is not necessarily the same thing as your vocation. Have you considered that what you do to pay the bills, put food on the table, and keep the electricity on is not your defining purpose in life? I'm not advocating quitting your job, sitting around and waiting for God to clearly communicate His purpose. But I am challenging you with the possibility that God has, God has something far greater in mind, something far more eternally significant than just what takes place at the workplace. God made you to serve Him. He calls you to serve Him. He's even gifted you to serve Him. And sometimes at this point, people say, I, I know He's not talking about me, but I am. God wants to use you. He created you to be used by Him. He's already prepared works for you. It's kind of a cliche, but I absolutely believe this is true, that God's not so much concerned about our ability as He is our availability. There's a story about a missionary in a remote, poverty-stricken area in West Africa. He appealed to support for Christians' work throughout the area and encouraged those present to give what they could for the construction of a building which would serve not only as a clinic but as a place of worship. Approximately two hours later after the worship service, a young woman came to the missionary and presented him with $40 to be used for the building project. The missionary was stunned. Where on earth, he thought, did this woman come up with such a large amount of money in a region affected by painfully forbidding circumstances? Confounded, he posed the question as politely as he knew how and was informed that she had gone to a wealthy planter and sold herself into his service for the rest of her life. Why? It was her way of giving herself into the service of Jesus Christ, not partially, but totally. Now, that sounds like a, a, a pretty radical price to pay, doesn't it? However, if you think such a measure of commitment is radical, think again about God's grace in saving you, and understand that a lifetime commitment of service is an appropriate response, because all of life ought to be a continual outpouring because of His grace. The other scripture that Prakash read this morning came from Colossians. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. Now listen to this last sentence. It is the Lord Jesus Christ whom you serve. Service is an appropriate response to God's grace. Service assists to edify the body of Christ. You also heard this morning, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
And here the word for service is the word from which we get our word uh, deacon, which literally means to wait on tables. The context of Peter's words, along with what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians and, and the book of Romans, is the body of Christ. Our lives should be dedicated in the service of Jesus. And while serving Jesus and serving the church are not identical, they are not mutually exclusive. I will say that serving or ministering to Jesus isn't just limited to the church, but it is vitally connected to the church. And while there are ministries, you've heard about one this morning, and opportunities to serve Jesus outside the local church, it is the local church, the body of Christ, that is the primary means by which we do ministry in this world. He has called you to serve his church. There was a, a minister who was approached by a man who expressed a desire to become a member of his congregation. The man said, though, that he really was rather busy and wouldn't have time to volunteer. I don't want to be called on for any services such as committee work, teaching a class, or singing in the choir. Then, too, don't expect me for worship very often. The minister thought for a moment. He said, I, I think you have the wrong church. The church you're looking for is three blocks down the street. The man followed the preacher's directions, and he came to an abandoned, boarded-up, closed-up church building that had gone dead, out of business. I'm going to be blunt. If you're a member of this church family, then you should be serving this church somehow. The question is, are you? And if not, why not? See, not only are we supposed to serve, but you need to serve, not only for the sake of, I think, obedience, but for the health of the body. And if you think that this is just another typical preacher manipulation uh, to, to, to create some guilt or coercion, I want you to listen to the word of the Apostle Paul from the Common English Bible Translation. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers his purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured up by the standard of the fullness of Christ. As a result, we aren't to be infants any longer who can be tossed and blown around by every wind that comes from teaching and deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth in love, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from him and is joined and held together by all supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up in love as each one does his part. As each one does his part. The problem is that when some parts are not doing their part, the whole body suffers. And that happens way too often in churches, where most of the work is done by a comparative few who are on the edge if they've not already burned out, uh, trying to do their part and somebody else's part also. I came across this short kind of tongue-in-cheek piece. There is a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to do, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody would do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it, and it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Just kind of have to think about that one for a while. Scott Libby, uh, a traveling minister for a Presbyterian church in Iowa, was to preach for a vacationing uh, minister one Sunday, so he decided that he would get to the church early and become familiar with the order of service and the layout. And as he's going down the hall, he passed the nursery area where he saw one child there all by himself. He paused for a moment, and the child said, Hi, my name's Tommy. And Dr. Libby said, Well, my name's Scott. Tommy said, I'm all my, by myself in this big room. And Dr. Libby repeated, so you're all by yourself in this big room? Yes, said Tommy, and I'm lonesome. Well, I'm sure somebody will come shortly and be with you, Tommy. And with this, Tommy pulled up to his full stature, looked Dr. Scott in the eye and said, what about you? <laughs> what about you? 
What about me? What about us? As each one has received a special gift, employing it and serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the biblical metaphor of the church, which compared the church to a human body. And the, the contrast of that metaphor was in the context of spiritual gifts, God-given abilities for service. In that 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are a variety of ministries, but the same Lord, and there are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Notice, by the way, that the entire Godhead is connected in the distribution of spiritual gifts, of which there is tremendous variety. There's a variety of gifts, a variety of ministries in which those gifts can be used, and a variety of results that can result from the ministries in which those gifts are used. I told a friend one day that I had no idea what the possible combination of those three factors could be, and he answered, oh, it's easy. It would be spiritual gifts to the third power. I like that answer. The truth is, as we looked at this, nobody has all the spiritual gifts, but no believer is without a gift. God is the one who composes the body. So there are no unnecessary or unheeded gifts. Maybe you know what your spiritual gift is, maybe you don't. Maybe you're thinking, I'd like to serve, but I don't know how to serve. Well, you don't have to be a theologian or a scholar to serve Jesus. You don't have to have a world of amazing talent. What you need, though, is a servant heart and a willingness to commit. Let me tell you that if you know how to sit in a rocking chair and rock a baby, if you know how to love on a toddler, you can make a big difference in the lives of some people and a huge encouragement for some people in this church family. See, if we're willing to do our part, We'll help you find how to do it. One person wrote, there's a purpose for you being here. You are meant to answer something, solve something, provide something, lead something, discover something, compose something, write something, say something, translate something, interpret something, sing something, create something, teach something, preach something, bear something, overcome something, and in doing so, you improve the lives of others under the power of God for the glory of God. Service is the appropriate response to God's grace. Service assists to edify the body of Christ. Just one more thought. Service accentuates our worship of God. When I was preparing this message, uh, I discovered that in the, in the New Testament, there are basically three, there might be more, but I found three words that are translated by our English word serve. Now, I already mentioned the word, which means to wait on tables. And in the verse from Colossians where Paul says, it is the Lord Jesus Christ whom you serve, the word means to be a slave. The apostle Paul uses the third word when he wrote, for God whom I serve in the spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness, how, how unceasingly I mention of you. And it's interesting that this word for serve is the same word that is used in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And it's a word that is translated worship or carrying out the religious duties of worship. You remember that verse in Romans 12, 1? Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. When God brought the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt, he brought them to a mountain where he gave them his law, part of what we call the Ten Commandments. And if you remember, the first two commandments were this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them, now listen, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of our fathers on the, of the children on the fourth, third, fourth generations of those who hate me. You shall not worship them or serve them. A couple of years ago, we went through the Gospel of John, and back then I, I mentioned I wondered, well, how, how, did, how did idolaters serve their gods? It would seem apparent that they trusted in them, they had faith in them, hoped in them. They believed that maybe by uh, believing that the, the idols had some sort of power, whether it was to make it rain or bring a good crop or to make their family fertile. But how did they serve them? Did they sign up for the Idol Fellowship Committee? I don't think so. Probably not. But they prayed to them. 
And, and the more gruesome way they served him was in all kinds of perverted rituals of worship that involved things that I don't even want to mention this morning. And the reason they did it is because they were terrified of the consequences of disobeying, choosing to put themselves through personal danger and physical abuse to appease any anger, to, endure, uh, to, to ensure that they might have an easy life. But it didn't work because their gods weren't real. I can't help but think if people were willing to make those kinds of commitments and sacrifices to gods that weren't real, how should the believer in Jesus Christ serve the real God who is real? We serve him as a living sacrifice, dead to self but alive to God. Every aspect of our life as a believer is to be yielded to God. This is how we serve God. It is how we worship him, by giving up our lives to him so he can work in us both to do his will and to work for his good pleasure. Bill Booknight wrote about a true story that was told to him by Dr. Edward Bauman of Washington, D.C. A boy named Tony was born into a family in a Midwestern state. He was blind at birth. He suffered from an extremely rare eye problem for which there, at the time, was no known cure. When the little fellow was about seven years old, his doctor read in the New England Journal of Medicine a new surgical procedure that showed some promise for this particular problem. A young surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston had developed it. The local doctor and the surgeon began communicating. The boy's full medical record was sent, and a decision was made to try surgery. Since Tony's family couldn't afford the expenses that were involved, local churches and civic clubs helped out. Tony had a favorite teddy bear, which he kept with him almost all the time. But that teddy bear was beginning to show signs of wear. One eye was missing, one ear was chewed off, and, and through several holes the stuffing was oozing out. Tony's mother told him they were going to buy him a new teddy bear when he took the trip to Boston, but Tony rejected that offer in no uncertain terms. What good is a new teddy bear when you have an old, familiar, friendly one already broken in? So the old teddy bear went to Boston and remained close to Tony through all the medical procedures leading up to surgery. X-rays, tests, consultations. In fact, the boy and the teddy bear were not separated until the anesthesia was applied. Throughout the whole period, the boy and this young surgeon were becoming great friends. In fact, the surgeon was almost excited uh, for the family about the possibilities of surgery as they were. There was just a, a really good chemistry and friendship and trust between this young doctor and Tony. And when the surgery was completed, Tony was heavily bandaged and remained quite still for a number of days. That's kind of hard for a seven-year-old. But each day, the surgeon was in and out of the room encouraging him. Finally, the day came for removing the bandages. And for the first time in the seven years of his life, this little boy could see. Though the vision was blurred at first, it gradually clarified. And for the first time, Tony looked into the faces of his parents, saw a tree, saw a sunset. The young surgeon was almost literally jumping up and down for joy. Before long, it was time for Tony to be discharged and to go home. The surgeon had actually been dreading this day because the two of them had become such good friends. On that final morning, the surgeon signed the necessary discharge papers. He gave Tony a big hug and said, now listen... I own stock in you. I expect to get letters from you regularly. Do you understand? And then Tony did something totally unexpected. He said to a surgeon friend here, I want you to have this. And he handed him his teddy bear. The surgeon's first impulse was to say, oh, no, I can't separate you two good friends. But then something stopped him. And with a flash of sensitive genius, the surgeon understood what Tony was trying to do. He wanted to give his dear surgeon friend the most precious gift at his disposal because so full was his heart with love. The wise surgeon accepted the teddy bear with a hug and a thank you, assuring Tony that he would take mighty good care of his friend. Do you know that for over 10 years that teddy bear sat in a glass case on the 10th floor of Massachusetts General Hospital? 
One eye missing, one ear half chewed off, stuffing coming out of holes. And in front of the teddy bear was the surgeon's professional name card. And just beneath his name, he had written this caption. This is the highest fee that I have ever received for professional services rendered. A little boy had given the most precious item he had out of a love-filled heart. Book Knight then adds, 2,000 years ago, a gracious God with a heart filled of love looked upon our sin-marred, tear-stained world. Had you and I been in charge, we might have destroyed the whole mess and started over. But God's great heart was too full of love to allow that, so he gave the most precious gift of his disposal he gave himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Confronted by such an awesome gift, our only fitting response is to fall on our knees and enthrone the living Christ as our personal King of kings and Lord of lords. And I would add that such a response also demands that we serve him with a continual outpouring of gratitude. We serve him because service is the appropriate response to God's grace. Service assists edify the body of Christ, and service accentuates our worship of the Lord. Let's pray together.